drive is going good, so. So, my uh, seventh day before the Mormon prophecy, scripture prophecy video, I received a death threat. This is typical for Mormons. And I even talk about it in the video. I keep talking about it. Video after video. Mormons are evil. They keep demonstrating they're evil. <clears throat> a guy by the name of Hammerhead said uh, three hours ago, try as you may, try as you might, your death threat, all in caps, my death threat, mm -hmm, of President Nelson will not succeed, will not, is in capitals. Do you know what a hammerhead is? I know of two off the top of my head. One is a deadly human killer shark. The other is the head of a hammer. Hammerhead. Used to kill humans. Technically murder, but the difference between murder and kill is kill is self-defense. Murder is aggression. First blood. But those who commit murder justify it by saying they had to defend themselves. But officer, he was black. I had to kill him. He was a threat. That's called racism. That's not an excuse for murder. Mormons are racist, sexist, bigoted, hateful of the poor, terrorists, insurrectionists, criminals. And they keep proving it time and time and time again. This video will be put up tomorrow for number five, day before. <clears throat> and so, I have to keep explaining because YouTube is a channel supporting white supremacy. They support the church. And shut down my video to silence me. Shut down my channel. <clears throat> and so science. You notice patterns in your life. You go, oh, that's interesting. That's a pattern. And patterns are predictable. And then along comes an anomaly. Something that doesn't fit the pattern. And so then, and so then you say, okay, well I need to develop a theory to explain the anomaly. But you can't stop there. Because that would justify anybody claiming anything. You have to test it. See, those who follow Q never test them. Except for the one guy who stormed the pizza parlor looking for the basement that didn't exist. For the hostages of Hillary Clinton. And yet, they just go silent about it. But still believe it. My mom, for example, 9-11. The first wave of misinformation was that Saddam Hussein was responsible. And then when we found out the truth, my mom, still to this day, believes and claims Saddam Hussein was responsible. Now, my mom is different. She doesn't follow Q. She doesn't follow the Internet. We have a cousin, Darren, who was on the prosecution side with the billions of lawyers against Saddam Hussein in that trial. And so, she's a little biased. 
but that's where her fallacy argument comes from is that our cousin my cousin her uh, nephew <coughs> technically nephew-in-law because he's on my dad's side uh, was there helping to hang him but in the church Mormons in Utah culture tend to reinforce the fallacy and the lies from Mormons. I remember when Hinckley, as the president of the church, got up, did a fireside for the young single adults, and I was aware because I had to set up refreshments after it was all over with and I was all alone I was supposed to be set up with a woman as a partner because we're supposed to get married that's what they do is they pair people for assignments male and female hoping that spending time together will get to know each other and fall in love and get married in the temple for all eternity yeah well I was alone in the singles ward <laughs> and he uh, said he recommended you know he wasn't given a law he didn't say thus saith the Lord he recommended you know like a word of wisdom it wasn't a commandment that women should have only one set of earrings. He said it's okay to have them, just one set. Not all over the ear. Not stretching out the ear. And yet, after it happened, this was before conference, Everybody was going nuts, saying, oh, we're, we're forbidden from wearing earrings. And Mormon girls were saying, I'm making a covenant and a promise to do away with all my jewelry. Not even one. I'm going the extra mile. And then Nels, or Hinckley made it worse, because in conference, he then changed it to a commandment. <sighs> and so yes with the death of Nelson this terrorist sends me a death threat he knows it's not mine I have in this video and in those videos the whole signs, patterns, prophecies. This is just a test to see if the 17th is the date. I'm not going to do anything. But yet, Mr. Death Threat, calling himself Hammerhead, is justifying sending me the death threat by saying it's me who's sending Nelson the death threat when I've already gone over you with the prophecies Nelson sent me the death threat over the pulpit of conference he knows this he purposely disregards it he's a terrorist that's what they do But this concept of fallen prophets has been around since Brigham Young. Well, Joseph. But uh, those were the guys who wanted to take over. And yeah, the, since Brigham, Mormons were wanting to take over because they believed the prophet had fallen. 
But Joseph or Brigham Young put in section 85 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which is our numbering for our Doctrine and Covenants under Brigham, the year before he died. But we can validate that it is from Joseph because it was in the times and seasons. Whereas uh, the section 132 about polygamy is put in the same edition. No existence. Nowhere. <clears throat> and so with the removal of the chapter on monogamy and the gutting of section 131 which precedes 132 it's very clear what Brigham's intention was. That it was from him. Because the linguistic pattern does not match Joseph's. So section 85, verse 7, is about the one mighty and strong. Should I go over it first? I guess I'll have to. Huh? There's a whole Wikipedia page on it. That's how prominent it has featured in the history of the church. And it shall come to pass that I, the Lord God, will send one mighty and strong, holding the scepter of power in his hand, clothed with light for a covering, whose mouth shall utter words, eternal words, while his bowels shall be a fountain of truth, to set in order the house of God. That's the temple. Didn't Joseph Smith set in order the house of God? Why does it need to be reset in order? This is 1832. Cartland wasn't until well. I think it. Well, I'm gonna have to check here. No, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. 1836 so it's before the temple and so yeah some people like Joseph Fielding Smith Sr. believe that it was no longer needed so I'm gonna stop and come back so as I've shown in all my videos all these years Joseph Smith is not isolating this from everything else he's talked about. This is a part of it. And it cannot be separated and distinct from the rest of what he has talked about. All has to do with the latter days. That this one mighty and strong is to come out of the great and abominable church just like Jacob the father of the house of Israel the usurper of the birthright and blessing and so no longer was Esau to be the father of this latter day Christ that's what he is do I need to go over your temple initiatories again with you Christ is a Greek word for anointed What are in the initiatories? The first booth is for washing to become a high priest and high priestess. Then you go to the next booth for your anointing. King and Queen. Christ. Now you take upon yourself the name of Christ. And instead you get confused with Jesus. Because the first vision explains to us that the creed that started all creeds, defining who Jesus is, is an abomination. We're not Christian. Mormons, therefore, are worshiping another god. And 
and so everything is about coming out of the great and abominable church to restore it to restore the original and so you go through the scriptures Abel is murdered Cain now rules they put Seth in that's the murderer of Osiris kind of interesting how he introduced him as a separate person rather than naming Cain Seth but nonetheless Noah is the Christ who restores the kingdom with an Armageddon effect the flood and so the Wikipedia page uh, says it parallels Isaiah 28 2 <laughs> try Deuteronomy 18 <laughs> God not even Wikipedia can footnote correctly but uh, in Deuteronomy or Isaiah 28 Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one, which, as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, cast to the earth with the hand. Uh, Isaiah 11.11. Isaiah 11. Why wasn't that first? You're supposed to put the earliest one first. <laughs> Who did this article? And it shall come to pass that in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros. Again, coming out of the great and abominable church. In this particular case, it's the world here. That's why the gathering is needed. But that's not the mighty and strong one. I don't know why you were referencing that one. And then 2 Nephi 3. I went over that in yesterday's video. One of yesterday's videos. And so sure enough, how did I know? <laughs> why don't Mormons believe me? Oh, right. They're too busy justifying murdering me. I'm calling it killing. <clears throat> Since the prophecy was proclaimed, many Latter-day Saints have claimed to be or to have otherwise identified the one mighty and strong. I've gone over with you how to do it. All these guys are whack jobs, just as they claim. But he must fulfill scripture prophecy. He can't just claim the title and change his name like Brian David Mitchell did. And it was the wrong name, Brian. Emmanuel. What did he call himself? It may have had Emmanuel in it, but... See, because he doesn't have his own Wikipedia page... It's under Elizabeth Smart kidnapping or kidnapping of Elizabeth Smart. <sighs> oh, other names Emmanuel, David, and Isaiah. Isaiah, seriously? David. So, yeah, he did have the alias of Emmanuel, but he was just throwing names out there. He doesn't understand what it means. He's not that smart. Some schismatic, why not spasmatic, Latter-day Saint sects have arisen as a result of such claims. You know, like all the ones when Wilford Woodruff refused to go to war against the United States. Well, 
least now they have, does not to go to war against the United States. Now, there was a letter written to W.W. W. Phelps, as I said. Joseph, let's see, yeah. In a letter dated to Brigham Young, dated May 6th, 1867, Phelps mentioned that he believed that Smith's prophecy refers to Adam and his future arrival at Adam on Diamond. Is this going to be a source for this? Remember when I told you that we have to check to see if somebody else before Smith Jr., Fielding Smith Jr.? Because as far as I know, he's the originator of Adam on Diamond. But, as new information has arisen right here in this video, live, for tomorrow, <laughs> it may be possible that Phelps is the creator. <sighs> Having not understood what Smith taught. Ba -da 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 -da. Uh, let's see. The first Latter-day Saint denomination to canonize Smith's prophecy, yeah. In 1876, the excerpt from the Smith Phelps letter was included as section 85 in the church's edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, a work of sacred canon for believers in the faith scripture. And they don't tell you anything else. But I did, didn't I? 1876, the year before Brigham Young died. The same year, Section 132 came out in that same edition, with the removal of the chapter on monogamy. And so this is suspicious, because he needed to solidify Joseph as the author of 132. So who is Brigham Young thinking is being referred to then? And seven, and then eight. This is how you do research, people. And so here's the 1905 statement from the first presidency, Joseph F. Smith, Sr. And it's, the other guys were just, yeah, okay, whatever you say, sir. Because it's Joseph F. Smith who's writing this whole thing. It's a long document. It's not your regular statement from the first presidency. <laughs> and say, he says it's a closed prophecy. That's what he concludes. Technically, he says, I have no idea what it is. <laughs> but I'm going to say it's closed. He says that. Get it. It's online somewhere. It took me a while to find it. Uh, you can buy it in a book form with others, but it's online somewhere. It's a sacred secret. <coughs> and so, yeah. Uh, the, the problem in this claim is that the president of the church, Joseph F. Smith, Sr., Who's the one in charge of temples? Setting in order the temples, if they need to be set in order. Him. He's authority. No one else's authority. Only the president of the church's authority. So why the hell would a bishop have authority to set in order the temple? They don't. That's your first clue that what Joseph Smith did was veer off topic to prophesy. prophecy of a future presiding bishop <laughs> again I already showed how that's dismissed and they're all referring to that same uh, first presidency message so here's contemporary 
curriculum material published by the LDS Church. Oh, no, no, Jesus is angry when you say LDS. For use in the church educational system favors the first that is closed rather than a future presiding bishop. No, again, you took it out of context. All of the scriptures, put them all together, and what do you got? Bibbidi bobbidi boo. The Christ of Mormons, Emmanuel. And so here are the claims James Strang, Joseph Smith III. What about Joseph, the first, Junior? He's not listed here, is he? Adam, <laughs> Brigham Young, yeah, Brigham Young, uh, James Bridgehouse, Brighouse. See, 19, 1870s, Oliver B. Hunting and others were the ones saying, oh yeah, Brigham's the one mighty and strong. Joseph was evil. So guess who Oliver B. Hunting is? They don't have a link to him, apparently. But uh, he recorded in his journal, oh, therefore it's canon scripture. <laughs> it's got to be true. In 17 or 1878, two years after, that he was convinced Brigham Young was the one mighty and strong. The LDS First Presidency's 1905 letter on the subject mentioned what the others have insisted that the late President Brigham Young was the man who fulfilled that prediction, which means Joseph Smith is the fallen prophet who is murdered by God. Not Willard Richards in the back. I wonder who those others were. People just don't think. They think they're protecting the church when they reveal something stupid. And so another William David Creighton. Uh, Possibly Jesus Christ. That's the current belief. That if it's going to be anybody, it's Jesus. They believe the Deuteronomy guy is Jesus. So therefore, the one mighty and strong is Jesus. But then who is number or verse 8? If Jesus is 7, who is 8? <coughs> Uh, Samuel Eastman, Paul Feel, Francis M. Darter had his Wikipedia page removed, Benjamin F. LeBaron, Wikipedia page removed, <laughs> L.A. Sherwood, Wikipedia page removed. Etc., etc., etc. More LeBarons. Yeah, there are quite a lot in there. Lafferty, Brian David Mitchell. I don't see, oh, there's Denver Snuffer. Uh, but that was by his followers, not... Uh, he doesn't have an organized religion, guys. He just has followers. So they're claiming that there are members of his Fellowships of the Remnant movement. That's, that is not a church. But yeah, I don't see Chad Daybell on here. Lori Vallow, she believes she was a goddess to help Jesus. Unless her kids were zombies. And so you can see how warped people are when they purposely withhold information, when they purposely lie and deceive. So hopefully I have nothing more to add because this is going to be for number five days before. And again, I'll put the clip at the end of this. 
and then I'll have it ready for tomorrow. But uh, I, Mormons just will not learn. They don't want the consequences. So if Nelson dies, everybody's going to think that I prophesied this. No, I only recognized the patterns. And I obviously haven't caused it. The church have been caught ordering and paying for my assassination. I still have the receipts. And so for this terrorist to rise up and claim that I'm the terrorist, he's just projecting who he is. So, but again, like I said, if nothing happens on next Friday, this coming, well, yeah, next Friday still. we then have to go back to the drawing board to see what happened and why. Because Nelson and his death is how we'll know. See, with Monson, I found out after he died. I was still trying to figure out the tale from the dragon part. And so, after Nelson died, or Monson died, I went, Oh, oh, I wonder if there is. And then, ta-da, figured it out. I had already figured out the uh, Revelation 12's sign of the birth and conception. Well, conception was after, but the birth was before. Uh, the Tetrad, or not the Tetrad, the fifth day of darkness from Revelation 12. Yeah, that one before and before this one, which is a reversal pattern that I've gone over with you in, at the end here. <coughs> and so there have been others that have happened. With uh, Lavelle Edwards, I went over that in a video yesterday from my Amazon publications. Uh, that was after he died. Learned he died. Checked to see if there was any kind of sign. Because again, that's not just for prophets. I got to see if others can be involved. And Lavelle, yeah. But not many others. But uh, yeah, there's a thing with horses in the sky. As he was a horseman, I found out. So yeah, those. Things need to be tested. You can't just say, oh, oh, there, there's clouds over the moon. That's a death sign. <laughs> and then if nothing happens, you go, oh, well, you know, <laughs> like Seventh Day Adventists. They predicted the end of the world. That didn't happen. They're still in existence. As they still celebrate the day they were wrong. <laughs> hilarious but uh, yeah the prophets are silent they won't talk about it <coughs> but they know it because they're causing it so alrighty and uh, in case anybody didn't catch it, it in the part where I talk about how September used to be the seventh month Septem Octum, Novum, Decum. Well, Decum is ten. So the part about Babylon destroying Jerusalem, the first was a siege, then was the conquering. Notice, ten, four. Isn't that interesting? And so Revelation, twelve, three and four which originally was the 17th, and it's in the video. So, just pay attention, because there's just way too much to just ignore this. 
Yeah, I wasn't there before Monson, but I'm here now before Nelson. Just understand, it's not my prophecy. It's God's death pool. Because of his patterns. Unprecedented times call for unprecedented measures. My dear brothers and sisters, these are the latter days. If you and I are to withstand the forthcoming perils and pressures, it is imperative that we each have a firm spiritual foundation built upon the rock of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. What would I say to Brigham Young, Wilfred Woodruff, and the other presidents on up to President Thomas S. Monson? I'm gonna meet him soon. <laughs>